By the time the young woman was discovered floating in Teal's Pond on July 11th, 1908, decomposition had already begun to set in with a vengeance. Dressed in her finest clothes, her blonde hair was a tangle of knots and pond debris, partially hiding a face whose beauty had been stolen by four days of rotting in the water. There was a piece of ribbon wrapped around her neck. Her skull had been crushed by a heavy blow to the back of her head. Nearby on the shore, her delicate white gloves were neatly folded and resting beside her fancy straw hat, which was accessorized with a pin monogrammed with the letter H. Rendered unrecognizable by advanced decay, the woman had to be identified by her clothes and dental fillings. She was 20-year-old Hazel Drew, a governess with a stellar reputation in the community. At the time, her death shocked the small mill town of Sand Lake, New York, and over a hundred years later, her case would be the inspiration for the story of Laura Palmer, a character from the TV show Twin Peaks. But while Laura's killer was caught, who murdered Hazel Drew would remain a mystery for more than a hundred years. Let's get into it. Hi, I'm Chris. Thanks for clicking on True Crime Recaps. It's not hard to see why the creators of Twin Peaks found the legend of Hazel Drew so captivating. After her death, the police worked their way through a revolving list of suspects, but the investigation was severely limited by the forensic advancements available at the time. And while they couldn't pin down the murder's identity, they did learn a lot about Hazel. Although each new piece of the puzzle only seemed to bring more questions. Before her death at age 20, Hazel was thought of as a wholesome girl. She'd been working for a number of powerful, well-connected families in Troy, New York since she was 14. Her close proximity to them gave her a taste of the kind of privileged lifestyle she wouldn't be able to experience otherwise. Now, despite her modest salary as a maid, she dressed in expensive clothes and took frequent trips to Boston, New York City, and Providence, Rhode Island. How did she afford all of this on such a tight budget? According to a close friend, she was just really good with money. Here are her exact words according to information published on HazelDrew.com. Quote, I never saw her in the company of a man all the time I was in Troy, and she told me on more than one occasion that she had no sweetheart. Hazel could make a dollar go farther than any woman I've ever seen. But is that the whole story? The evidence investigators pieced together told a very different tale. About a month before she was killed, Hazel told friends she was planning to spend the 4th of July weekend at Lake George, a resort spot tucked in the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York. On July 3rd, the night before she was supposed to leave, she stopped by her seamstress and begged her to make a new shirtwaist from the fabric she was holding in her hands. She didn't have much time, it was already almost 11 p.m., but she wanted to look her best for the beginning of her short vacation. And much to her delight, the seamstress agreed to make it despite the late hour. And soon she was on her way back home with the perfect piece to complete her look. She was still wearing it when her corpse was pulled from the pond eight days later. For some reason, Hazel never left as planned the next morning. She spent the holiday with her aunt Minnie Taylor instead. A few days later, on July 6th, she quit her job without warning, packed her things, and left the residence of her employer, Professor Carey. Nobody really knows why she decided to leave. According to everyone she knew, she seemed happy as the governess of the Carey children and never expressed a desire to find another job. We don't have a full picture of what was going on during Hazel Drew's last hours of life, but we have some pretty clear snapshots. She was seen at the train station several times, either waiting for someone or traveling around. According to her friends and family, she gave conflicting reasons for her plans. She told her aunt, for instance, that she was planning to meet up with some friends, but even though Hazel did run into a friend at the train station on July 6th, it definitely wasn't planned. She told that friend she was going, but didn't explain any further. She checked a suitcase into the storage locker at the station and took a train headed for Albany. The reasoning behind this remains a mystery, but a series of letters uncovered after her murder, written by a man with the initials C.E.S., seemed to shed a little light on her movements in those final hours. Now here's a line from one of the letters from the mystery man. Your merry smile and twinkling eyes torture me. Your face haunts me. Why can't I be content again? You have stolen my liberty. Please don't forget a promise to write. 
When I reach Albany again, I will meet you at the tavern. I must see you soon, or I'll die of starvation. Was she planning to meet up with him before her death? It certainly seems plausible. She had six letters from CES in her possession. Each was written from a city Hazel had recently visited. It stands to reason she was regularly making trips to rendezvous with this man in the course of his own travels. Whether or not they actually made contact on the day she was found is unclear. When the police searched the suitcase she'd left behind, they found it packed with all the essentials for a getaway. Clothes, nightgowns, her toothbrush and comb. But there was an extra little tidbit hidden at the bottom. A clipping from the local newspaper that read, Edward Lavoy has departed for Chattanooga, Tennessee, where he will remain all winter. Unfortunately, though, the police could not make any connections between Edward and Hazel. The identity of the person she may or may not have met remains a mystery, and their role in her tragic fate stays as murky as ever. We don't know where she spent that night or how she made it back from Albany, but she was seen back in Sand Lake the next evening. July 7, 1908 was an unbearably hot day, but she was dressed to the nines in her layered skirts, elegant boots, and fine white gloves. She didn't seem to mind the heat all that much, according to one couple that spotted her picking raspberries along the side of Taberton Road, very near to Teal's Pond. They noticed her beauty right away, and out here in this secluded place, it gave them cause for concern. Dusk would be falling soon, and there were few places quite as dangerous for a pretty girl than a patch of dark, isolated woods on either side of a deserted road. Those fancy Victorian heels weren't exactly made for running, after all. But like most any other couple in a similar situation, they followed the age-old social contract of minding their own business. They continued on their way and left her to her raspberry bushes without a single care in the universe. After about 15 minutes or so, another pair of travelers came across Hazel at a curve in the road that some locals referred to as Piss Hollow. One of these travelers, a 17-year-old farmhand named Frank Smith, recognized her immediately and they exchanged greetings. He had a pretty heavy crush on her, as it turns out, and some people suggested that his crush was more akin to an unhealthy obsession. Naturally, this made the authorities look at him a little closer. Generally described as slow by those who knew him, Frank gave a handful of conflicting stories and alibis. And for years, he was pretty high on the list of possible suspects. But given the lack of concrete evidence available, that doesn't really mean much. The police were under an incredible amount of pressure to solve the case, both from reporters and the locals. And their list of suspects ran nearly a dozen names long at times. When they hit a wall with one suspect, they simply moved on to the next one. Without the benefits of that modern DNA analysis has to offer, there wasn't much more they could do without a confession. Later that night, a woman heard a girl screaming in the area, but didn't think much of it. Until a couple of days later, anyway. Another likely suspect, it seemed, was Hazel's own uncle, the recently widowed William Taylor. He lived less than a mile from Teal's Pond and helped pull her bloated corpse from the water once she was found. Described as suicidal and melancholy, a good number of people who have studied the case believe that William was the true killer, thanks in no small part to the behavior of his sister, Minnie. When questioned about the death of her niece, a family member she was very close to, Minnie, refused to cooperate and even advised Hazel's friends to do the same. According to her reasoning, it would be unfair to drag the names of more innocent people into the mess. But there's also a good to fair chance she was covering something up. Some of the more tabloid-esque publications at the time suggested that the women were often seen traveling together in the company of men, leading to rumors that they were engaging in prostitution. It was well known that Hazel lived well above her means, after all. Was it possible she had herself a little side hustle going on? If she did, she was exceptionally good at hiding it, especially from her own family who told the newspapers that she had no known sweethearts and very little to do with men. The trunk full of letters found after her death said otherwise, however. Hazel had many admirers, as it turned out. Speculation continued to fly as the trunk's contents were poured over and scrutinized. There were dozens of letters and postcards, mostly only signed with initials. One letter in particular, written by a man calling himself Harry, included an apology for bruising her wrists. 
Naturally, this new evidence only served to throw more rumors into the wind where they spread around like dandelion seeds. Everyone wanted to know what happened to Hazel Drew and who she really was. As the police continued to dig, they unearthed a revolving cast of wealthy men embroiled in various stages of scandal, ranging from a prominent member of the Republican Party that was rumored to host wild sex orgies not far from Teal's Pond, all the way to a married dentist that had recently proposed to Hazel, despite already having a wife. Can't imagine how that went down with the current missus. There were four local businessmen in particular that appeared to have ties with the young woman, but the extent of her involvement with them could never be proven. Some believed she had relationships with all four of the men individually, while others believed it was uh, more of a group affair. One of the men, the owner of the local funeral home, was the person responsible for Hazel's autopsy, prompting whispers of some sort of cover-up attempt. Another man, the town veterinarian, was rumored to dabble in the dark arts. Some believed the men got rid of Hazel after discovering that she fell pregnant, while others theorized that she'd been murdered out of jealousy. With so many entanglements and supposed affairs, it was impossible to pin down a motive, much less a murderer. The police were left holding on to more leads than they knew what to do with, and every single one of them came up short. After a few months of investigation and constant head-scratching, all they had were more questions and precious few answers which leads to another, slightly less sinister theory. What if her death was actually an accident? Was it possible that while walking along the road, a driver hit her with their car and then panicked after realizing what happened? Well, maybe, but probably not. Whatever happened to Hazel Drew, there's no denying the allure of her unfortunate story. Her many secrets became something of a local legend, while the person responsible for her death forever remains in the unknowable void created by a full century of folklore and allegations. Much like her fictional counterpart, the young Laura Palmer, Hazel seemed to relish the attention of powerful men. And much like Laura, she very well may have lost her life as a result. Even after all these years, people are still drawn to the drop-dead gorgeous girl from a long-forgotten time, eager to study a mystery that the police had no hope of solving back then. But today, two amateur sleuths think they cracked it. David Bushman and Mark Givens wrote a book called Murder at Teal's Pond that explains how they reached their conclusions. And who do they think did it? Two local men, William Cushing and Fred Schatzel. Here's some of the evidence they laid out in the book as reported in the New York Post. Fred Schatzel was an embalmer at a funeral home in Troy. On July 6th, they say he reserved a horse and carriage for a friend of his, William Cushing. And where was the carriage meant to be going that night? Sand Lake, the area where Hazel was found, 20 minutes outside of Troy. And as it turned out, the men had quite a lot in common. They were both well-known movers and shakers in the local Republican Party, but more importantly, they both knew Hazel. On the night of July 7th, a Sand Lake couple noticed a fancy city carriage in the area around Teal's Pond, but William and Fred were quickly cleared. However, the authors now say that they were only cleared because the Republican Party controlled what went on in the town and the investigation was really a cover-up. But if they really did it, and why, has yet to be proven, which means her death is still officially a cold case. So who do you think killed Hazel Drew? Was it the creepy, emotionally troubled uncle? The teenage boy with the slightly worrisome crush? A high-profile politician with an infinity for sex orgies in the woods? A secret lover from the train station? Even now, the answer depends on who you ask. With so many plausible scenarios and so little evidence, speculation feels like a poor substitute for closure, even after more than a hundred years. Before I say goodbye, I want to tell you how this case became the foundation for the popular TV series Twin Peaks. It's pretty interesting. Apparently, the co-creator, Mark Frost, grew up spending his summers in Tarbenton, New York, near the pond where she was found. And his grandmother used to tell him scary stories about the ghost of Hazel Drew haunting the forests forever. The legend stuck with him until the day he and David Lynch were brainstorming a new series concept. And the rest is history. Thank you so much for watching. Let us know who you think did it in the comments below. And if you like getting all the crime in half the time, please take a second to give this a like and tap subscribe and the bell so you never miss a recap. 
Until next time, take care. Mm-hmm.